Tony Gates for inviting us. Uh, you know, when, when your name starts with a vowel <laughs> instead of a consonant, uh, nobody understands what you're saying. So for many years, I told them I am a Bates, a Gates, a Yates, with something missing. Right. Of course, not all that. So I'm glad to meet somebody that's all that. Amen. Just have to deal with, you know, the cards that the Lord gave me. If I've got something missing, it's just uh, to the best we can to make it work. And I want to, uh, I want to give honor to Pastor Yates. It's been, uh, where was it? August. 1974, I rolled into town, knowing that God had called me here to build a church, and uh, <clears throat> this was the first time that anybody wanted to remember that I ever was here. Thank you. Now, this is a very commendable thing for your pastor. Not because it's me. Because it reveals some character. You know, we live in a day when uh, I don't have to tell you, most folks, it's all about me. Whatever's going on, it's about them. And that's it. But it's good to have some folks around that remember, you know, there was something here before I got here. And uh, so I commend you. And thank you for your trust. Ah, he, he's really tore up. But you know, Darren is a sweet old man. And, you know, I'd be thrilled if I could go home and tell Keith and Tim both y'all got the same. Come on, amen. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. Yeah, that'd be good. Amen. The Lawfords couldn't see me tonight. And uh, all the rest of you, Sister Hall. Sister Hall, I was sitting in the cafeteria a number of years ago. Just went over to the table, sat down to eat. A couple of women sitting there. I didn't pay any attention. I prayed and started to eat. And she looked at me and she said, Are you my brother H? I said, I don't know. I'm Brother H, but I don't know if I'm your brother H. I don't know. She said, Well, I'm, I'm Virginia Hall. And introduced the lady that was there with you. Is she here tonight? And uh, I said, oh, oh, well, yeah, I, I guess I'm the one you're thinking about. <laughs> and uh, Pastor Yates, you, you really have messed me up for the last, why did you wait so long to come and call me? Ask me to call me. Call me. <laughs> we all come that night. <laughs> <laughs> I've had all this time to, uh, every now and then in the middle of the night, you know, I take a trip back and I, I remember all these things I have forgotten. But I promised my wife, because I do try to sleep <coughs> But uh, I promised her I would not spend much time going back over some things. There, I, I think there are just a few things that would be good for every congregation to know how the foundation was laid and how they got what they got. You know, whether it's here or wherever it is. And uh, when I came into town, I had never been in this town before. God called me to, to, to build a church. Never been here. Didn't know what was here. Didn't know what I was going to see. But when I got to the city limit sign, I broke down and began to weep so much I couldn't hardly see. And to come around the curve here, the Lord told me to build a church right there. I would see. Okay. Went on downtown. I didn't like nothing. I said, <laughs> I went around the square and I thought, oh Lord. He says, where do you want me? Okay. Here we go. And uh, every Friday, if JW was home, every Friday when I came in from work, I went by the house. Now, some of you, uh, Sister 
Hall, of course, and also the J.W. How many of the other associates are here? You didn't know him? Uh, Leo's over here. Every Friday, I'm knocking on his door Friday afternoon, and I said, uh, I want to buy that piece of property. He said, it's not for sale. I said, you're going to sell it to me because God told me to build a church here. It's not for sale. See you next week. <laughs> and I came every week. He was not, he, he, he drank and he went to, uh, was addicted to horse race gambling. So if he was, if he was not home, that was usually during the time of the horse races and it was hot springs. But I'd knock again and again and again. And finally, one day he said, I'm going to sell you that property. I said, Good. He said, I'm going to sell it high. I said, name the price. And he told me, I said, mark it sold. Get the papers ready. I'm going to have a little paper. And we're going to do it. And then I was, I was going to a bank. An older lady that was here back then, an older lady back in the 70s that had a lot of money. Uh, I'm wanting to pull out a name black. No, I'm not talking about the one that came to church. I'm talking about here in town. Oh, uh, her name was Black. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said, go see her, you know, maybe she'll help you. So I went to see her, and she told me, so we don't need no more churches in town. We got all the churches we need. I said, God told me to build a church. I lived in it. Right. So I started going to the bank. President, Mr. West. And uh, I'm not knowing. Went back there and he kept telling his son, I can't loan you any money. You don't have a church. I said, No, but I'm going to have a church. And we're building a church. And I need the money. Finally, he told the receptionist not to let me back in there anymore. So on Saturday, I'm knocking on his front door. There you go. He opened the door, very dignified, white haired man. You remember? the door and he looked at me and said, son, I was 24 years old. You know. What do you want? I said, Mr. West, I need to borrow money to build this church. He said, come in, son. Took me in. He had a sunken, sunken living room, white leather couch and recliner. Gave me a very soft seat. And he said, let me explain to you. So he starts telling me the same thing. He said, you haven't understood what I said. And I was very kind. I waited till he got through. When he got through, I said, I understood. I understand what you're saying, Mr. West. I understood it the first time you told me, the first time I came to the bank. I know what you said. But God told me to build a church. I need a loan, and you need to give me a loan. He said, come to the bank Monday, and I'm going to give you a loan. how this got here. Wow. Whenever you start building a church, there's a lot of things. And I have people, I just got through building another new building. Uh, where we are, another new church building. And, uh, you know, people come around and they, after you're gone, and they say, why did he do this? Why did he do that? Two things, two answers I've got to that every time. When they want to know why did I do it, I want to know where were you when I did it. Come on. <laughs> if you'd have been there, you'd know why I did it. Right. You'd have known how short the money was. You'd have known how short we were on health. You would have understood a lot of things if you were just there. So you want to know why? You can start a business. And whenever they come, they get to look at you close. I said, I know that you're looking pretty close, so you want to buy this? Come on. <laughs> well, how did it get here? I was, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a few more things here. I need you to I think they're relaxed. You know I preach a lot. 
they would come to church and one time they'd come in, we just had lights hanging. And the scaffolding would be over here and the pews over here. The next service they came and I had the scaffolding over here and the pews over here. They put the ladder up for this um, pile of stuff. I was right out here, just about over her head, right there, up on the scaffold, trying to hold a poor nail gun. Trying to hold a 20 foot one by four up with my head and on a chalk line at the same time and get a nail nailed in. I go, I work all day, come in, come out of the house, give my wife a hello kiss and a goodbye kiss, and she'd hand me a little sack lunch and I'd come back out here and I'd go to work. I worked till I couldn't go any further. And that night, I just kept on trying, I couldn't get that done. Finally, I took that board and I threw it off the scaffold right down the middle of the floor. I climbed down off the scaffold and I took my nail like that loose and my hammer and I slung it across the floor. And it went back and hit the corner right there in the middle. And I said, God, if you want this house built, you're going to have to build it yourself. I can't do it. No help. I just can't do it. I'm through. I walked out the door, locked the door, and went home. My wife said, you know, back awful quick. I said, I'm through. She said, what do you mean? You're not going to work any more than that? I said, I mean, I'm through. God wants that church built. He's got to build it. The week of 4th of July, 1975. She said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. And I called and borrowed a tent. We went to Hot Springs National camped out a couple of nights, come back with a vest at night, rejuvenated, picked up my nail apron, climbed up on the scaffold, and put the board together, kept working. You say, you ought not have told that. No. Yeah. What do you mean? You think I'm not human? Come on. Read Hebrews chapter 11. Right. And every one of those men and women that are in there as uh, in the hall of faith, Abraham lied about his wife. That's right. Come on. David committed adultery. Kill, had a man killed. You keep going. Noah got drunk. You see, the key was not having some human weaknesses every now and then. The key was that they didn't quit. That's right. And they turned around and they believed in God, went back to work and did what God said to them. And God said, by faith, you'll do it. By faith. <coughs> we the church at uh, midnight. The next day, men were out here out of the next group. I said, what are y'all doing? Because on Saturday then, I got more work to do. I said, what are y'all doing? They said, well, you were roofing at midnight. We're trying to see if the shingles are straight. <laughs> I said, what about it? He said, they're straight. How'd you do it? I said, God, give me a full moon. <laughs> we just kept working. Kept working. I'm going to say this and then, and then leave that over. Yeah. I'll tell you, there's a gas line that goes right about there. Comes right across here. It comes at an angle up here to the top. And I paid a guy $50 one day just to come and hold one end of it so I could get the thread started on the other. And I paid another man fifty dollars to help me get through getting the uh, decking on the top, and that's the only hundred dollar labor that was paid out on this bill. The rest of it was me and Brother Mills stuff. My father would come down here and help us at times. And, uh, we worked together. We worked New Year's Day. God gets you. But you know who gets the glory? God, God gets the glory. Right. When I drove out of town, I said, God, it's yours. Hands off. Never one time have I 
meddled with any pastor or anything, anybody was doing down here. Doesn't matter. If I wanted to control it, I needed to stay here. And then God said, go. It's not mine no more. It's his. And y'all got to get a job. Got a real good job. I'll see if you how long you got here. August will be two years. August will be two years. Um I see a lot of improvement. I came through here. Uh, six or seven years ago, I'd been in Forest City for the past seminar and dozen years. Got a phone call. I had a, a sister that was caught on the dying in Alexandria, Louisiana. So I left there and went down Highway 1, which brought me through here. So I took a moment and I drove over here by the church, looked at it. Didn't look near as like it does now. I saw a lot of work that needed to be done. And I just took it wrong. Wasn't my vision. I just kept going. So when I got here today and I looked over, looked over and I saw the parking lot is in better shape than it was then. The siding on the building, uh, the shrubberies, it all looks good. Commend you. And that don't happen without good leadership. That just don't happen without good leadership. Uh, I've been in, uh, I've just been preaching 55 years, I've been pastor 50. And it just, it just don't, it don't just happen. Somebody's got to say, we need to do this. Let's do it. Let's raise some money. Let's get her done. I commend you. Things look good. Very good. And I don't resent a thing that's been changed. I don't. I built it to function for them. And then it all needs remodeled. It needs a change. It needs a place to live. You don't need a pastor living back there. I built a living quarter so that I could pay the bills. I had to live there. I couldn't pay rent and pay the bills. So I built somewhere to live so I could pay the bills. I'll talk to you. Let's, let's stop. Uh, Thank you for having us. Um, before I begin with, um, before I start talking, let me say something. I told you I'm not all there. <laughs> we are living in changing times. There's been a lot of changes in the last 47 years. A lot of changes. There's been a lot of changes in the last. 60 years, the last 70 years. And there's going to be more changes. We live in changing times. Always around us, there's a lot of changes. And, uh, you know, people ought to be getting smarter. <laughs> right? I mean, we've got all kinds of opportunities for folks to get education, to get, get smarter. And, and I wonder, I wonder, why do, why do smart people believe dumb stuff? You ever thought about that? Why do smart people believe dumb stuff? I'll tell you why. Because they just believe what a friend told them. They believe what a parent told them. They go to some church somewhere and they preach something and they say, well, they ought to know and they believe it. Because they're too lazy to get into the Word of God and figure it out and find the truth. So smart people believe dumb stuff. I wish I could say everything. You know, it's just all in it. But I got, I got to do something. It's right. I don't know what it is. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. We're not preaching yet. We're just, you know. 2 Timothy 2 and 19. If you stand for that reading if you want to, but you probably won't want to stand every time I read this because I can give you a bunch of it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. 
Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We are living in changing times. But the word of God has never changed. Amen. Amen. And it will never change. Amen. It matters not what generation. It matters not what changes come and what... What gets dictated or what kind of things that we assimilate into our lives from the world, the Word of God does not change. The foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God standeth sure. Amen. The Lord knows them that are His, that everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from him. You may be seated. In Washington, D.C., at the tomb of the unknown soldier, every hour there is the changing of the guard, and there is just a little moment after they go through all their protocol and all their salutes and all of their movements, and, and then just before one guard lets go and the other guard takes over. There's one exchange between them, verbal exchange. And that exchange from the one that is leaving, guarding the tomb, to the one that is going to guard the tomb. He says this, the orders remain the same. They have not changed. They salute each other and change positions. I'm happy to tell you today that the orders that Jesus gave before he ascended on high Come on. have not changed. Amen. 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 Jesus Christ Amen. is the same yesterday, yes, sir. today, and forever. Hallelujah. The foundation stays sure. The foundation doesn't change. And the commission and the charge has not changed. Luke chapter 24. Verses 45 through 49. Jesus had uh, explained some things to them. This is just before he ascended. And then verse 45 said, Then open he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. He said unto them, Thus it is written, Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Amen. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Bible says, then he has said it. That's his last words to his disciples. This is the charge. This is what is to be done. That repentance, remission of sins, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost be preached to all people beginning at Jerusalem. Amen. Well, we know what started there, and that's very important. Because if we, if we buy into a doctrine that did not start and was not first preached in Jerusalem, we have bought into a false doctrine. That's right. We have bought into something that has evolved through philosophy, that has evolved through men's tradition, that has evolved through... Uh, the influence of men's reasonings. Right. And it is not the word of God. And it is not what was told to be preached. And, and that's why smart people believe dumb stuff. Right. Because they don't know where it came from. They don't know how, how it came into being. They don't know everything that the Bible says. 
and they find themselves. Listen to this very carefully because we must watch and guard ourselves. They find themselves serving and worshiping another Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. Another Jesus. Paul said this other Jesus is not another because there is no other. But they have adopted another Jesus, another gospel, another salvation. Paul said, if anybody come preaching any other gospel than this which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said, as I said before, you will say I now again. If any man, though he be an angel from heaven, and he preaches another gospel, than this which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Pretty solid, isn't it? I'm glad that we know who Jesus is. Amen. It's important that we stay in the book. I want to preach to you tonight. <laughs> Come on. Preach now. Ready? I want to preach to you a first century message for the 21st century. First century message. Reading in Acts chapter 24, reading verses 22 through 27. And when Felix <clears throat> heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he declared them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the utmost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul, to let him have liberty, and that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Notice, what did he want to know? The things concerning faith in Christ. Amen. Verse 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should be given him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. But after two years, Porcus Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul back. In, in verses 1 through 21 of that chapter, we're going to read that. We, we have the account of Paul's trial before Felix. In the setting before us where we begin to read, there are some things that have been taking place where Felix had called for Paul over and over. I don't know what all Paul may have told him. But everything that I find out, Paul was not bashful about this gospel message. He was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Amen. So he, he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But, but the purpose with which Felix called for him again and again was concerning his faith, concerning his faith in Christ Jesus. Let me give you a little history in order to understand some things on this particular day that I've just read the scripture. In verse number 24, Luke tells us that Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. You and I read this, and no big deal. So he came with his wife, Drusilla. But whenever you look a little bit closer, 
you find out that the word that you, Luke used for his came with his wife, Drusilla. The word that he used there for his actually means his own wife, Drusilla. You see, what had been going on was that they were used to seeing him come around with another woman or another woman. But this time, he came with his own wife, Drusilla. Hey, this stuff about swapping partners and, uh, you know, two-timing and shacking up and living with folks you're not met, that didn't start in the last few years. That's been going on for a long time. Right. The eights, I've been, I've been marrying more folks than, Lord, I've been married. Them. Because they're coming in and they're getting the Holy Ghost and they want to be baptized because that's what I preach to them. Right. And I say, okay, but are y'all legally married? Man, it makes you want to do a little dance when they say, yeah. Because well, most of the time, uh, no. How long have you been together? 17 years, 10 years, three months. But we need to be baptized, right? Well, we need to get this sin question cleaned up first. Right. I, I can't baptize you living in a dog. Right. That's why I'm all hooked up right now. That's good. And you know, they don't ever, they don't ever fall. They know it's wrong. So that, that's what repentance is about. Amen. And now let's clean it up and let's get it right. Amen. Right. Amen. So, you know, for a long time, I never married anybody I've been married before. No, under no condition. It ain't going to happen. Even if it was all out in the world, I'm just not going to do it. But I found out if I'm going to get these people straightened up, Get them saved. Well, sometimes they got a wife that's off back over young in another country and a divorce that got started and it's not ever been finished. And we got to work with lawyers in other countries to finish getting these divorces finished up so they can marry who they've been lived with for the last 17 years. But somebody's got to stand for the Word of God. Come on. Somebody's got to say, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Hallelujah. And the Lord knows them that are his. And let them that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. Well, let's clean it up. Yes, sir. Amen. One day I married an Asian couple at about 10 o'clock in the morning. At about 1 o'clock in the morning, I'd driven an hour and a half over to another county. And I married a Spanish couple that afternoon and baptized them all the next Sunday. Got to get them ready. Got to get them ready. That's what it's all about. You know, there's some sin that's got to be laid down. Well, let's, let's get back to this. So, he comes with his own wife. Drusilla was a Jewess. She was a Jew Jewess. She had married when she was 14 years old. This is her second marriage. Felix lured her away from her first husband using a magician to help lure her away from him to Felix. Drusilla, uh, not only did, did they have this problem, she was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I who had put James to death, the apostle James. Her uncle had John the Baptist beheaded. Her great-grandfather was the one that killed all of the Jewish babies in Bethlehem when they found out that Christ had been born trying to get he that was born king of the Jews. What I want you to see is this woman had a long history of background, of situations that was in opposition to the church, in opposition to God, in opposition to ministry, here is Paul standing in chains. They think that he's the one that's bound. 
And they're sitting in royalty. And they think they're free. Come on. They're the ones that's bound. That's He's right. the one that's liberated. Amen. And free by the power and the grace of God. Her, her life was filled with immorality. All kinds of things in her life that showed that her morals were at odds with God. I'm talking about sin. At odds with God. Morals that were at odds with God. All of us that are here today, I don't, I don't know all of you, I don't know where all of you come from, I don't know where she came from, I don't know where you came from. Amen. I, I don't know anything about the rest of you, but I can tell you this. We all came out of a background that was contrary to God. Yes, and we needed a place to get it all under the blood. Amen. And let the power of the Spirit of God do a work in our life. Be filled with His Spirit that would change us, transform us, Hallelujah. make us brand new. Give us the power to be able to live victorious over that sinful life and the things that He is delivering us from. Amen. Felix somehow still wanted to hear from Paul. Perhaps he had a heart that said, I'd like to be delivered from this unscrupulous, sinful, filthy lifestyle that I have been living. You know, there's a lot of folks that we meet that's got a sweet smile, fake smile. And you get real sensitive in the Holy Ghost, you can tell which ones are real and which ones are fake. You know, they're putting it on. But on the inside, they're wondering, is there any deliverance? Is there any hope? Is there any help? Amen. And I believe that Felix was wrestling with this, though he, like so many others, was not willing to pay the price to be delivered, to be set free by the power of God. In verse number 25, then, Paul launched into his first century message before the government. Did he ever preach to us? What we read was he dealt with um, the new birth in a roundabout way. He got, to, he got to that. He began to talk to them about, we read it, righteousness, temperance, and judgment. There was no compromising the message to the governor. Right. Amen. Let me tell you again. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. It doesn't matter what kind of letters we have after our name. It doesn't matter what kind of office or position we have. Or it doesn't matter how low we are. On our in our living and, and what we don't have and how low we're having to live. That doesn't matter. The message is the same. The message is the same. Everybody needs to know Jesus Christ. Everybody must be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and must be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins and must depart from iniquity in order to see the Lord in peace at the end of the age. Everybody, everybody, you're a family member. You know, the one that you, I really don't want to say it because it might upset them. It, uh, do you want to see them saved? If we want to see them saved, we say it anyway, in love. Right. In love, right. but we say it. Right. they got to know. How are they going to know? If, you know, if all they hear is folks telling them dumb stuff, they're going to believe dumb stuff. But when you start telling them the truth and showing them the truth in the Word of God, they just might, they might make them mad. But I, I remember a time I was in Mountain Home, Arkansas, pastor the first church, and there was a guy that uh, had been there before I got there, and he came down and he would, you know, he'd pray. I'd give an altar call and he'd wait, 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 till I was about to quit, and all of a sudden he'd come down. So I prayed with other folks that night, and I didn't pray with them. After service, we're standing back about two-thirds of the way back. And uh, he said, uh, 
At least you didn't come pray with me. I said, no, I didn't. You want to whine? He said, why? I said, because I knew you weren't going to get the Holy Ghost anyway. He said, well, how do you know that? I said, because you don't want it. That's me, Sister Hall. You're right. I said, you don't want it. I said, anybody that's got to be begged to come get the greatest blessing that God can give you. Anybody that stands around and wonders, do I have to have? No, you don't have to have it. You can go to hell if that's what you want to do. You don't have to, you don't have, to have the Holy Ghost. But you get to have the Holy Ghost. Come on. It's a beautiful opportunity to know the Lord and the power of the Spirit of God. And anybody that's got to be begged to come and pray don't want it. And he left the church mad. He was so mad. That he got the Holy Ghost the next day about 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and he told me, he said, you know, you're right. You made me so mad. And I began to think about it. I said, you know what? I guess I really didn't want it. And I got to have it. And I began to pray. And God filled me with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Sometimes they just got to get mad. Hey, don't worry about them. Just, just the word. Just the word. Just live for God. And, and, and give the truth. That is preacher in our town. I was in his office one day. We were, we were visiting. And uh, we were having quite a still visitation. And uh, I said, uh, Pastor Wright, I, I, don't, I don't have my Bible with me. But I see yours laying there on the corner of the desk. Pastor died. Trinity Baptist Church there in Springfield. I said, would you open your Bible and let's, uh, let's have a Bible discussion. He said, no, I won't. I said, you won't open your Bible and let's talk about it? He said, no. I said, you've got a congregation that's depending on your journey to take them to heaven. And I've got a congregation depending on me to take them to heaven. And there's only one truth. Ever, you can't both be right. There's only one truth. You can't both be right. I said, we can both be wrong. But we can't both be right. So I said, I'm begging you, please. If I'm wrong, would you please help me be saved? And if you can't show me in your Bible, then let me show you. And he said, I won't do it. And I said, why won't you do it? You know what he told me? He said, because every time I get in a discussion with somebody, I get so confused, I don't even know what I believe. I said, well, I don't have that problem. Let me help you. Right. <laughs> Let's get in the Word. Amen. Let's look at it. Amen. Why do smart people believe what he said? Get in the Word. Amen. The truth. The word of God. That's a blessing. So he talked to them about uh, what was it? Righteousness. Temperance. And faithfulness. In Acts, I want to tell you something. When you read your Bible, this is another reason people They think when they read a verse of scripture and they, they find, oh, I got me a jewel here. You know, just believe on the Lord and thou shalt be saved. That's what he said right there. I've got it. Wait a minute. Listen. Listen to me very carefully. If you don't get anything else, get this. Whenever we read our Bible, the Bible doesn't always tell us all that was said. Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 40. Said, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and with many other words. Right. What are they? Right. With many other words did he 
testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Amen. There were more words said, there were more things pointed out than just what got in that little portion of Scripture. Then in Acts chapter 16, uh, verses 25 through 34, Paul and Silas been in jail, you know, the first jailhouse rock. <laughs> they sang and they prayed, and the jailhouse rocked, and the, and the doors came open, the gates came open, and the jailer was about to kill himself. And they gave him a little something to hold him for a minute. Don't kill yourself. Just read it. Acts 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And that means they weren't doing it under their breath. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors opened, and everyone's band was loose. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep. And seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had all fled, had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. Then he called for a light, sprang in, came trembling, fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said unto them, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And folks, very dumb stuff. Because somebody tells them that's all you got to do now is believe on the Lord and you and your house is going to be saved. How many of you ever saw somebody's whole family get saved just because one person believed on the Lord? This is an individual salvation. So what happened? He told him that to keep it running the sword through him. And then the Bible says in verse number 32, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord. <laughs> now that I've got you to put your sword up, let's have a Bible study. Right. <laughs> and they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. They didn't say nothing about being baptized up there. How did he find out he needed to be baptized? And how was he going to need to be baptized? In Jesus' name. How did he find that out? Because they spake the word of the Lord unto him. Amen. 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 They kept telling him about the rest of it. They were baptized. He and all of his house straightway. And when he had brought them into the house, he set me before them, rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. My point is, he did more than just And so, Paul before Felix thought of, I got something missing, but I still remember that. <laughs> Paul before Felix, he did more than mention righteousness and leave it up to Felix and the rest of them to try to decide what he meant. He did more than mention temperance and leave it up to them to decide what they needed to do. He did more than mention the judgment to come. He talked to them. He preached unto them. He expounded these points. Righteousness. What is the definition of righteousness? Righteousness is purity of heart and rectitude of life. Changing life. Fixing life. Conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness is used in the scripture and theology, which is where it's usually used. It, it is equivalent to holiness comprehending holy principles and affections of heart and conformity of life to the divine law of God. It includes all that we call justice, honesty, virtue, holy affection. In short, it's true religion. So when he preached unto them about righteousness, he didn't just say you need some righteousness. Y'all figure it out. He talked to them about this woman, 
that's not supposed to be your husband or, or, or your wife and, and the things in your life and the things that need to be straightened out. Yeah. Some folks are afraid to name sin. I come from an old school, you know, they preached it like it was. And big men started crying and running to the altar. Amen. I've seen them come in the, in, the, in the church where I'm pastoring now. I've seen them come down, never been in the church, not, didn't know what we were preaching. But they came down to the altar. I said there is a, a spirit of holiness. It's not just a message of holiness, there's a spirit of holiness. And I've seen them come down and begin to weep and cry. One guy that named Randy talking, he went and cried, pulled out his, his cigarettes and gave them to me. And then he pulled out his, his roach, and it wasn't the one you know you just, you know, for the marijuana. And he said, this has got to go. And little Billy jumped up. He said, I'll be back. I'll be back. And he ran out the door. I said, what's going on now? And then little Billy come running back in. And he said, here's my, here's my cue stick. I'm, I'm re he's repenting. Amen. He's cleaning things up. I've seen him come to the altar. And, and while they're there at the altar, I've seen him begin to pull their earrings out and lay them down. I've seen them begin to pull their finger rings off and their necklaces off and lay them down. What in the world is going on? Somebody is learning something about righteousness. Oh. Somebody's letting the power of the Holy Ghost do some talking to them. Amen. I haven't said anything yet, but the Holy Ghost says some things every now and then. Right. Yes, it does. Well, hallelujah. So he talked to them about righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Man, I, you better give me a clock. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, don't do it, don't do it. Chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus said, I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. They had a lot of self-righteousness. But self-righteousness is as filthy rags. It will never measure up to God's righteousness. Amen. We just got to get humble and surrender to God. Say, okay, God, here I am. You're, you're the boss. I'm whatever. Whatever. I'm yours. And let him move in our life and get the righteousness of God. Then we don't strut around and say, look how righteous I am. We say, you know, we, we serve a righteous God. And God loved me so much that he brought me out of the world and into the kingdom of God. And I'm willing to give him anything and everything. I'm just glad to be delivered from the power of sin and darkness. God has done a good work in my life. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse number 6. But we are all as unclean things in all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all, we all do uh, fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Jeremiah told us in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We can't measure up on our own. But we can find an altar of repentance. Yes. And we can say, God, here I am. Take this filthy life that I used to live. Take what I used to be. Take what I am right now. And wash me and cleanse me and make me pure and make me holy. And I will arise from here. And I will let your spirit lead me and guide me. And I'll be what you want me to be. Friend, he didn't hold anything back on the governor and his own life. Amen. And then he talked to him about temperance. Just real quick, let me tell you that temperance is, um, is self-control. When I was a kid growing up, every time they talked about temperance, all I ever heard them talk about was not overindulging in alcohol. So I thought that's not something it is. If you got temperance, you just don't drink too much. Then I found out you ain't supposed to drink none. And then I begin to read the scripture and find out self-control is what temperance is. Right. Amen. That, that, that other temperance about not too much alcohol, that came from one of those churches. <laughs> it didn't come from an apostolic church. It came from somewhere else. And smart people believe dumb stuff. And they told me. But I got into the word and I found out, you know, it's that temperance that will help us 
and keep us whenever temptation comes. It is temperance. Right. That, that, that self-control that says, you know, uh, I'm not going to do it. Simple, Till you try it. Come on. Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's getting hard. Not if, if, if just keep controlling yourself. Just keep saying, I'm not going to tell them what I think about it. I'm not going to give them a cursing. I'm not going to steal that. I'm not going to deal with somebody that I'm not supposed to be dealing with. Right. I'm, I'm, what are you doing? I'm just letting the Holy Ghost help me have a little bit of self control. And live for God. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath, hath appeared unto all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. What say? Denying ungodliness. Well you know you just got to sin a little bit every day. No you don't. No you don't. No, you don't. The Holy Ghost. The grace of God that bringeth salvation teaches us that we 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 get involved and we deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And we live that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in eternity. No, in this present world. Right. Ah, yeah. we separate from sin and we live for God now. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might he might redeem us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Remember that last judgment today. He said, You better get some time straight, you better get control of yourself because you're going to stand before God. Judgment to come. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 13. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. You know what, Felix? We're in bad shape. But I have an answer. Come on. You know what, folks have got to see themselves as they are. Right. We have to see ourselves as we are every now and then. Did you know an altar repentance is not just for first coming to God. We need one again every now and then. I need one every now and then. Paul said we have an altar. We, the church, we have an altar. So in closing, I want to take you to the answer to the dilemma. Acts chapter 2. Verses 37 through 47. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Promise. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls, and they continued, and they continued, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possession and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. 
and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with the, all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So preacher, kind of been a little bit rough, a bit like Paul. You kind of pointed out some things that might be in my life. You got a little bold about it. You told me that we got to have some righteousness. We got to get it right. We got to get it lined up with the Word of God. You told me that we got to have some self control. But you told me that there's a judgment that's coming. And now you told me how to do it. Find a place here to repent. Get water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only name that can wash away sins. Nothing else will do. Father, Son, Holy Ghost won't do it. Nothing else will do. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And you shall receive. You shall receive. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God. Christ in you. The hope of glory. And it makes you walk in your life. And it makes you talk and get right. And it makes you start fellowshipping with the right people. And it makes you have all kind of gladness and joy because you're looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we stand together, our head is bowed, our eyes closed. I don't know who you are. I just know the Word of God. And I know what I felt that the Lord laid on my heart towards you. And I didn't put it together for here. That's a message that I preached some probably 15 years ago. But the Lord brought it back to me and said, this is it. This is what I want you to do. And I did it because somebody, somebody needs to understand there's a righteous God and there's a way to live for him. And there's a God that loves you and is ready right now. He's ready right now to wash away every stain, every sin, every ungodliness, if you're willing to call upon him. Hallelujah. So I turn this service back. I'm going to pray, brother. You just flip you on the place and pray. You want to pray? Come on, you want to pray? You want the Holy Ghost? You want to know God through the power of the Holy Ghost? You want a new renewing of the Holy Ghost? You want to get a little closer to the Lord? You want God to do a work in your life? Why don't you come and just find a place somewhere here a little closer that just makes a move that says, you know what, I, I want to pray. And, and, and Brother Ace, if you would, would you pray with me? Would you help me? I want what God's got for me. I want the Lord to do a good work in my heart and in my life. Come on, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise yes. God. Wherever you are, whatever your position yes. is, wherever you are in Jesus, and you're part of this church, I want you to know God loves you, and He wants you to move up closer to Him. He wants to do something for you right now.